Dasya Dhananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasma Shri Gurave Nama Shri Chaitanya Amano Vishtam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Padama Hyam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Hushri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Shri Rupam Sagrajata Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Pamsajivam Sadvaitam Sahabhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamsha Namao Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinandine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Namo Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namne Gaurat Vishaya Nama E Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namo Sute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhano Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Vansha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Rupa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudehe Vaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudehe Vaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudehe Vaya Narayanan Namaskritya Naranchaiva Naroktamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tatojayam Mudirakit Sarvashastra Abhiti Yosha Sarvavedaika Satpada Sarvasiddhanta Ratnadhya Sarvalokaika Dhritpada Sarvabhagavata Prana Shri Madhagavata Prabho Kalibhanto Dita Ditya Shri Krishna Parivartita Paramananda Pathaya Prema Varshakshara Yate Sarvada Sarvasiddhyaya Shri Krishna Yanamostume Madeka Bandho Mat Sangin, Mat Guru Man Mahadhana, Man Nistaraka Mat Bhagya, Madananda Namostute, Asadhu Sadhu Tadayin, Atini Chochataraka, Pana Munchakada Chinmam, Premnaraka Kantha Yohuspuda, Srimad Bhagavat Mahapurana Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. So we continue our discussions uh, on the 10 to 1st, 11th chapter. Uh, Lord Krishna's entrance into Dwarka. So we are about to end this chapter, last uh, four or five verses. So we have seen uh, till now uh, Lord's uh, entrance into Dwarka, his reception, and uh, how he was glorified and prayed to by Dwarka Vasis, the residents of Dwarka. And then after this, uh, there was description of Dwarka Nagri in few verses. Then we also saw how Lord was welcomed by the uh, uh, by Lord's own relatives as well as Dwarka Vasis on the street. Uh, you know he was welcomed by the ladies of uh, Dwarka by doing uh, his uh, pushpavrishti on him. And uh, in this manner we saw how uh, it was an amazing panoramic view of uh, you know Lord. Uh, I mean we remember that analogy of uh, Lord as cloud and then simultaneously there was uh, sun, two moons, as well as uh, two Indradhanus, Indradhanushas, as well as uh, lightning. So, you know, it was a wonderful, beautiful scene. And then after that, Lord entered the palaces uh, uh, of his, the palace of his uh, uh, mothers, Nandama, uh, sorry, Vasudev and uh, all the chief queens of Vasudev, I mean, all the 18 mothers of Lord, he uh, offered his respects to them and then afterwards he entered the palaces of his queens 16108 queens and uh, we have been discussing his dealings with them the great uh, ecstasy that they felt uh, when lord had come and also the reciprocation that they had so this is uh, the last uh, uh, section of the chapter in which uh, uh, now sudgo swami also speaks about uh, 
you know how lord krishna although seemingly with his uh, you know wives and looking like uh, you know he is just as a prakrit or just as a material person enjoys the conjugal relationship uh, he, it appears but it is not like that that it was a completely transcendental relationship and lord was uh, always situated on nirguna platform although he was uh, apparently seen as uh, you know enjoying like a householder so uh, yesterday's verse the last verse that we discussed was verse 33 and it in which we discussed by kaimutya nyay that how even uh, goddess of fortune uh, shri who is very chala or chanchala and uh, although she is of that nature and although she is the most beautiful uh, personality but even she cannot leave uh, the association of lord lord's lotus feet so what to speak of all these uh, uh, other queens of uh, lord who are like expansions of the goddess of fortune even the original goddess of fortune who is the source of all beauty and all uh, you know opulence even she cannot live with the lord's association then sud goswami says that what to speak of all these other ladies so this is how uh, we ended yesterday's discussion now in two verses sud goswami speaks how uh, when lord was uh, like this uh, having past times with his wives uh, with his queens the responsibility is like uh, removing the burden of uh, earth uh, you know finishing off or uh, uh, destroying all those evil kings that burden was actually nothing for the lord it it was just a very simple affair you know so that is spoken in two verses so you you may see that now the discussion is about you know uh, destruction of all those evil kings who were like earth's burden so somebody may wonder suddenly suddenly why is this discussion coming you know when we are talking about the sweet uh, past times of lords dealings with his queens so the discussion is coming in this sense that uh, discussion tells that how his enjoyment with the wives was unimpeded and all such respons- responsibilities like uh, uh, destroying these evil things and all they did not cause him any anxiety it was actually a very simple thing for him to do so from that angle uh, this is being spoken so we'll see the verse 34 evam nirpanam chiti bhar janmanam aksho vigni bhi parivratta tejasam विधाय वैरम श्वसनो यथानलम मिथो वधेनो परतो निरायुध द लॉर्ड वाज स्पेसिफाइड आफ्टर किलिंग दोस किंग्स हु वेयर बर्डन सम टू द अर्थ दे वेयर पफ्ड अप विद देयर मिलिट्री स्ट्रेंथ देयर हॉर्सेस एलिफेंट्स चैरियट्स इन्फेंट्री एटसेट्रा ही हिमसेल्फ वाज नॉट अ पार्टी इन द फाइट ही सिंपली क्रिएटेड हॉस्टिलिटी बिटवीन द पावरफुल एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर्स एंड दे फॉट अमंग्स देमसेल्व्स he was like the wind which causes friction between bamboos and so sparks a fire so uh, as we discussed this shlokas are actually take, talking about jeev goswami says garhaste leela sukhotkarsh dash darshanartham you know this is to show the great heights of uh, pleasure or happiness in lord's household life in which uh, the other responsibilities were actually uh, very paltry or they were not a cause of any anxiety for the lord so in order to speak that thing it is these verses are spoken although it appears like a detour from the topic but the point is uh, they want to say that uh, his enjoyment with uh, his wives was unimpeded you know it was just uh, never ever disturbed by any of these responsibilities because the lord did all these responsibilities very effortlessly so the shloka is saying uh, how did lord uh, uh, cause destruction of all these evil kings which were kshiti bhara janmanam evam nirpanam kshiti bhara janmanam so all these kings which were like a uh, great burden on the earth their lives were actually great burden on the earth aksho hini bhi parivratta tejasam and they were having this great phalanxes of army so because of which they were very much puffed up 
by of their uh, powers of their great provinces all these evil kings like jarasandh and all of them so what did lord do uh, i mean all other kings which were even part of uh, uh, kurukshetra war and all that vidhaya vairam shvasano yathanalam so lord arranged for uh, uh, enmity amongst themselves like we see in uh, kurukshetra war and mitho uh, vadhena and by causing enmity amongst themselves he caused uh, you know uh, destruction of each other by themselves and in this matter in this way uparato nirayudhah lord you know accomplished his pur- purpose and became uh, Uh, you know he he became uh, retired from those activities or relieved from those activities but he himself was nirayudha he was never party to any uh, any such fighting especially in terms of uh, wars like kurukshetra war where he was actually nirayudha literally he didn't uh, lift a weapon and he was not fighting from any side so to say that uh, you know he was not actively fighting like taking a weapon Uh, so in this manner he just uh, caused the destruction of all those evil kings by making them fight amongst them, themselves so the drishtant is given for this just as shvasano yathanalam so just like we see that there is this uh, uh, wind which causes the uh, great fire when the wind causes bamboo uh, you know trees to uh, you know collide with each other and by the interaction of that so we see that uh, there is a great fire that takes place and burns away the whole forest you know so actually wind is not the cause in one sense because wind is not uh, one who is lighting the fire but also because uh, wind is what is causing the friction between the trees so wind can be considered as a cause so this is how uh, we see that lord also caused the evil kings to fight amongst themselves and in this manner you know he got rid of uh, the kshatriyas which were burden on the earth so that is what is said in this verse so propa talks about how those who are false enjoyers they become the competitors with each other and then uh, that's how their military strength increases because they want to be false enjoyers and uh, by their military strength they start wreaking havoc so that is only called as dharmasya glani propat says this in the purport first part of purport so whenever such dharmasya glani or uh, the misuse of the energy of human being propat says happens so then that is the time when lord appears by his internal potency and uh, he alleviates the burden of the earth by not favoring any of the particular administrators but just causing um, by his power he causes a destruction by creating hostility amongst themselves so this is how he uh, finishes uh, the various evil administrators of this world of course uh, one thing is also that he he has his devotees uh you know side on the dharma and all the evil kings are there on the side of adharma and having this fight take place he also uh, causes a destruction like that but then especially uh, in in i mean in kaliyuga we can see that uh, all such evil forces are finished by lord just by causing uh, friction amongst themselves so this is how typically he accomplishes also things that where we see that uh, two great uh, competing nations they they uh, fight amongst themselves and in this manner we see that they actually uh, destroy each other so so we see that uh, this is how uh, lord accomplishes his purpose of uh, finishing of the evil elements in this world so this is what uh, he also did uh, when he was present and also what is spoken is uh, propat says that the only way out of this deluding energy is when one surrenders unto the supreme lord 
so that's when uh, one will be able to get rid of this deluding energy of the lord and who are those who don't uh, surrender unto the lord they are the people who are actually uh, they are possessing that demoniac mentality so he speaks about them finally four kinds of people who don't uh, surrender unto him so all those people are talked about in his uh, last paragraph of the purport so that's that's what uh, is the basic point of this purpose um, this purport so one more verse in which he talks about this sa eshanara lokesmin avatirna swamajaja reme stri ratna kutastho bhagwan prakruto jatha that supreme personality of god had shri krishna out of his causeless mercy appeared on this planet by his internal potency and enjoyed himself amongst competent women as if he were engaging in mundane affairs yes so sa esha nara loke smin avatirna swamayaya that supreme lord he appeared in this world by his own internal potency in this manner and he enjoyed with uh, the best of the uh, you know queens best of his uh, ladies wives and uh, reme stri ratna kutas so it is said as if you know just like a mundane person would bhagwan prakruto yatha of course bhagwan prakruto yatha is spoken so that means as if but it was not exactly like a mundane personality as if it were but it was not means it was a prakrit actually lord's enjoyment with his queens was completely transcendental it was a prakrit and that's how shila jeev goswami uh, translates this verse as uh, swamayaya that he he appeared by his own internal potency as uh, maya can have many meanings so maya word can have also meaning as uh, kripa you know or uh, maya can mean love or maya can mean jnana you know all such meanings are there maya can mean dambha maya can mean brahma all these meanings are there so shri jeev goswami says uh, swamayaya here means swa kripaya actually by his great mercy he came in this world he appeared in this world and by his great kripa he enjoyed with all his wives just like uh, a person who enjoys like a household but then he enjoyed with uh, his kripa i mean in order to share his mercy these all these wonderful devotees of the lord who were wives of the lord they wanted to reciprocate with lord the in the madhurya way uh, you know as husband wife relationship and lord is very merciful the way his devotees want to reciprocate with him as a friend or as a lover or as a parent or as a servant in that manner he also reciprocates so because these ladies wanted to reciprocate with the lord in this particular relationship so with his great mercy and compassion he enjoyed with them in that particular manner and very special meaning of bhagwan prakruto yatha also jeev goswami says so he says that and when lord was enjoying with all these uh, hastina i mean all the his, his queens at dwarka so it was like prakrutah he says it was like very natural for him prakriti stah it was his nature it was it was quite natural because he is the enjoyer no so instead of taking the meaning as mundane jeev goswami gives it the meaning as uh, uh, prakrutah you know meaning swa prakritistah means it is his nature to be an enjoyer by constitution he is an enjoyer and that's how he enjoyed quite befitting to his nature as an enjoyer so that's a very special meaning that shila jeev goswami gives to this words like prakrutah yatha so in this manner propad also talks about uh, lords being very transcendental when he is enjoying with his uh, wives and that's how propad says uh, in the beginning only of the purport that 
he married 16108 wives which itself is a very uh, very inconceivable thing and not only that he expanded into uh, 16108 forms to separately live with uh, each of the wife so that's how we can understand that it is something uh, extraordinary which is something not at all mundane but completely uh, transcendental also the word for the wives is tri ratna so it means that actually these were the jewels of the ladies they were the jewels of the women so this also proves that they were not some ordinary women they were actually best of the uh, you know devotees of the lord why they are considered jewels of the ladies because uh, they had the prema for the lord because they had prema love for the lord so they are called as tri ratna so it is not only just apparently referring to you know their uh, extraordinary beauty in terms of uh, uh, the feminine beauty but it's actually referring to their prema their extraordinary beauty of prema for the lord you know the love that they had for the lord and that's how they are known as tri ratna so jibo swami says that uh, they were actually most befitting for the lord you know lord's enjoyment was most befitting and these ladies were also most befitting for the lord because they had love for the lord so prema is what qualifies them to actually be uh, uh, receiving such a reciprocation from the lord and that's how lord's enjoyment with them because of their prema and not because of any karma is actually perfectly justified krishna is only uh, interested in somebody who has a love for him so that's how uh, all these uh, wonderful devotees of the lord who were his queens because they had love for the lord so that's why lord relished all those wonderful pastimes with them so that's the meaning of uh, it being completely transcendental fine so text 36 उदाह by making making him give up his bow in frustration and although even the tolerant shiva could fall victim to them still despite all their magical feats and attractions they could not agitate the senses of the lord so this is verse 36 so it was said that uh, lord just enjoyed uh, like a prakrita in the previous verse but his enjoyment is completely aprakrita but then somebody can say but how is that because lord seems to be enjoying like any other householder so how was that his enjoyment was not mundane although it is appearing like uh, he is enjoying with the typical you know, sense objects with his senses so vishwanath chaturvedi thakur says that this verse is answering that very precisely uddama bhav pishunam uh, vishunamala valguhas so it is said actually because of the great love that those uh, devotees queens had for krishna uddama bhava so they had this great ecstasy the great uh, expression of gambhirta uh, uh, of uh, uh, sa gambhir bhava you know the great expression of their ecstasy and uh, it was pishunama Uh, pishuna amala valgu has and this ecstasy was actually suchak was indicated in their beautiful uh, you know spotless smile which was also you know very beautified with their great uh, feeling of shyness that they ha- had so that great shyness and as well as their uh, beautiful glances so that they were so extraordinary so exquisite that they would smash even the cupid you know and uh, smash everybody by his uh, you know great uh, you know bow that he has the sharaf you know 
So such Cupid also was actually flattened in front of the great beauty of all the uh, you know wives of the Lord, Madano Piyasam, and uh, he gave up his actually chapam, you know, his uh, sharaf and chapa both. I mean the bow and the arrow, you know, he gave completely, thinking that it was useless actually to you know try to. Uh, I mean, hit those arrows on Lord Krishna or his wives because the great attraction they had amongst themselves was already, you know, without any, without uh, Madana hitting any arrows, they were already so much attracted to the Lord. And there was such a reciprocation of prema amongst Lord and them that uh, what is the use of my, uh, you know, Pushpaban and my uh, uh, Ikshu, what is called, Ikshu Chapa. Yeah, his sugar cane bow and uh, all the flower arrows that he has. So he he was completely bewildered actually at looking at Lord Krishna and uh, his dealings with his beautiful wives. So he gave up completely all his chapa and sharas, the bow and arrow. So such exquisite uh, uh, queens of the Lord, which are pramodottama which are the best of the women, the best of the ladies, even such beautiful wives of the Lord, they could not, by their uh, furtive glances and by their uh, you know, uh, attractive uh, feminine gestures, they could not agitate the senses of the Lord. So this is how he is a Prakrit. Actually, they could not agitate the senses of the Lord uh, by their uh, magical feats and by their feminine attraction. No. This is his greatness. Krishna was so uh, transcendental that uh, So let us understand this verse in its uh, actual sense uh, what exactly it means when it says that they could not uh, agitate the senses of the Lord, you know. So, uh, Srila Vishwanath Chaturthi Thakur explains this verse and uh, most of the purport of Prabhupada is actually uh, also based upon Vishwanath Chaturthi Thakur's comment. So, you know, Cupid has this task of uh, inciting that direction between man and woman and typically he does that uh, whenever uh, man and woman, you know, they are in presence of each other by Cupid by hitting his uh, Pushpavana. You know, he has five kinds of flower arrows. Actually, flower arrows, Pushpavan only in namesake because uh, it looks like flower, but it's actually a barn. <laughs> so it hits very hard. You know? And, uh, you know, all those arrows like Stambhana and Tapana and Marana, five kinds of arrows are there of. Uh, uh, this stupid. So he has this task. But when he saw Lord Krishna and his wives together, before even he could hit any arrows, there was such attraction between Lord Krishna and the wives of the Lord. And in such beautiful way, they were uh, glancing at each other that uh, Cupid became himself struck, you know, with wonder on seeing such a great sweetness of Krishna's, you know, pastimes. Such such intense attraction and such madhurya of Lord was there that even he, he was jobless, you know, he didn't have anything to do over there like that. In fact, he was so shocked by the great sweetness of the Lord. And when he started looking at the Lord, he fell down, you know, completely fainted, and all his uh, uh, you know, chapa and his uh, bond, his arrows just fell off here, there, helter skelter. So he thought literally that actually in the presence of uh, such, uh, you know, beautiful dealings of Lord with his wives, you know, what was the use of his bows and arrows? So, you know, he, he naturally wanted to give it up in this manner. So uh, with, with such uh, exquisite, uh, uh, you know, beauty also, when it is said that they could not disturb the senses of the Lord, what does it mean actually? So it means that they could not disturb the senses of the Lord by their, uh, you know, just to say externally, by their feminine beauty and attractions. No, they 
could disturb the senses of the Lord, they they were able to disturb the senses of the Lord by their prema and not by their preparedness. It was not by their furtive glances and by their uh, you know uh, attractions. It was not by their uh, fem feminine attractions that they were able to win the heart of the Lord, conquer the Lord, but it was by their prema, by prema, premna, shekuhu. By their prema, they were able to defeat the Lord, but not by the so called duty, you know, so to say, like that. So the point here is their glances or all that was because it was bedecked with love for the Lord. So that's how Lord was conquered. You know? So this has to be understood. Krishna is never conquered by any uh, material beauty. No, Krishna is conquered only by love. And one who has love, that person's, you know, all other uh, activities, all other gestures, they would also conquer the Lord. But without love, just by mundane beauty, nobody can conquer the Lord. So this is the point actually. By prema they could disturb the senses of the Lord. So although the verse says na shekuhu, it has to be understood, understood that kuhapair na shekuhu, that they were not able to defeat the Lord just by their feminine attractions. No. But premna, by their love they were able to defeat the Lord. So in this man, like that. In fact, uh, Srila Jeev Goswami gives a very interesting twist to the verse by saying that when it is said, na sheku, you know, what it means is actually even every queen was able to win the Lord and conquer the Lord only to that extent which was possible by their love. Only to the extent they had the love, they were able to conquer Lord that much. If, if there were great devotees who were better than these queens, like uh, suppose Queen Rukmini is there. So she is so exalted and she is, you know, so, uh, I mean, she is just uh, par excellence in terms of uh, her love for the Lord and in terms of her uh, beauty and in terms of her, you know, all, all her uh, uh, qualities. So suppose if... Queen Rukmini by her love is able to conquer the Lord up to certain extent. So another queen which doesn't have that much love like Queen Rukmini was able to conquer the Lord only up to that extent which she had the love. So Kuhakair Na Sheku, it means that if this another queen tried to defeat the Lord by imitating the gestures of Queen Rukmini, imitating the kind of activities of Queen Rukmini, so she could not defeat the Lord because she didn't have the love like the way Rukmini had. So there's a gradation of love also between the queens. And when we say that Lord was not defeated by their uh, uh, feminine attractions or by their, uh, by their mystical feats, it means that uh, sometimes within wives, you know, we see this. Uh, uh, Hare Krishna, is this okay or any problem? Hare Krishna, am I audible? Yes, please, you're audible. Okay, fine. So this is another meaning that I was explaining uh, that is given by Shukdev, uh, sorry, Shilajiv Goswami, where I was saying that uh, so in this manner, we see also that if, if some queen desiring a Samya, Samya Chaya, if she was desiring a Samya or equal status like Rukmini, and uh, she was trying to win the Lord by kind of imitating the gestures of Rukmini, she could not defeat the Lord like the way Rukmini did because, you know, she could defeat the Lord only to that extent she had the love. So this is also a very interesting twist to the meaning that Srila Jeeva Goswami gives. So they were able to conquer the Lord uh, in terms of uh, the proportion of love that they had, you know, in this particular manner. So although they are all queens of the Lord, we should understand that there is also gradation of love among, amongst them. 
you know so there is uh, prema atishay in case of uh, patta mahishis uh, the chief queens like rukmini and all that and then there are these other ladies also who have uh, varieties of uh, you know that kind of love kanta bhav towards the supreme lord you know so in this particular manner so prabhupada also speaks about uh, uh, the cupid and his activities in the material world so prabhupada says that how every male and female are attracted because of the you know cupid's uh, arrows like that and this is how the whole uh, material existence becomes a breeding ground for uh, all bondage uh, you know with that attraction there is graha uh, kshetra sutapta vittai and then a person becomes completely bound up in the material world like that so uh, this cupid not only has its activities going on within human uh, society but also within the animal society proper says like that but even such cupid was actually a uh, completely smashed by the grave and intimate dealings of lord and his consorts and uh, he was uh, completely defeated so this is how we understand the exaltedness of uh, lord's uh, past times with his queens like that so proper says this is towards the end of the purport maybe six line from the bottom therefore the queens could not satisfy the lord by their feminine attractiveness but they satisfied him by their sincere affection and service so propad also just uh, puts that point precisely over there that they satisfied him by their sincere affection and service only by an alloy transcendental loving service could they satisfy the lord and the lord was pleased to treat them as wives in reciprocation so we understand that this is how the queens were able to uh, satisfy the lord and uh, conquer him by their love and not just by i mean not by just feminine attractiveness that they had okay text 37 tamayam manyate loko yasangam api sanginam atmopam yena manujam vyapranvanam yato budah the common materialistic conditioned souls speculate that the lord is one of them out of their ignorance they think that the lord is affected by matter although he is unattached so sud goswami tells after describing all this past times that how uh, uh, lord is actually considered only by unintelligent men he is considered like them you know like some materialistic people who consider lord also like one of them it is that is happening only because they are a buddha you know they are actually unintelligent they are not very learned people so such lord tamayam manyate loko so there are people who consider lord to be amongst themselves he asangam api sanginam although he is completely devoid of attachment they think that he is also attached like them because atma pammena they consider him also like themselves atma pammena manujam vyaprun vanam yato buddha and they think that he is also like a human like all of us and that's how he is engaged in such activities but that is actually lakshana symptom symptom of uh, abudha a person who is ignorance uh, ignorant he is not having any knowledge so in clear terms uh, it is spoken that one who hey, wala angi ka sir bas liye ha one who thinks lord as uh, one of them is actually a very foolish person he is devoid of all knowledge sud goswami makes that statement very uh, categorically like that so this is the point shri vishwanath chakravarti thakur says that uh, who are these people these are materialistic people who think that uh, you know when they hear past times of lord like uh, lord uh, you know bringing this uh, parijat tree for satya bhav you know because she was competing with rukmini and she wanted the parijat flower so lord went all the way up to heavens and uh, brought uh, the whole parijat tree for uh, you know, queen satya bhama so somebody may feel like oh here it's trayuna here is lord who is so henpecked for his wife's sake he is fighting with indra and taking so much trouble but uh, actually this is how an abudha thinks an unintelligent person thinks because they don't understand that it is not karma with which lord is acting but it is completely acting out of love 
because satya bhama devi had such a great love for the lord so lord is bound to you know fulfill her desires bound to fulfill and reciprocate with her desires so this is a complete interaction of love it it is like a great nilamani is there huh? blue sapphire is there and one considers that blue sapphire as a mere glass you know nilamani kacham kachavat you know somebody thinks that nilamani as a mere glass so he doesn't understand the value of that so similarly lord's dealings with his uh, uh, beloved wives are like that nilamani but they are considered to be like ordinary dealings by those who are ignorant people who don't know the value of that great uh, nilamani so prabhupada also says this in purport and he explains that how such people not only have such foolish ideas but they also propagate these ideas these mundane wranglers and we see that actually it's so much prevalent especially in the kali yuga people have so many uh, misunderstandings about lords uh, past times with gopis radharani and uh, you know braj gopis or with lords uh, um, beloved wives so they write books on it and they are you know uh, big big scholars so called uh, with uh, 10 11 phd's and they write such books uh, com- making it to be a completely erotic affair like uh, the, of the mundane world you know so that's why there is a great need actually amongst people to give this right understanding about lord's transcendental nature and this transcendental relationship between lord and his uh, beloveds like that so this is the problem. this is the point propa even gives the example of uh, sun within the purport where he says that just as sun can uh, take all the contamination and uh, still remain pure so similarly lord's dealing sometimes in the material world may be seen as uh, i mean ignorant person may be seeing it as uh, as something mundane but uh, what to speak of these past times which are uh, completely his chit shakti past times because these uh, uh, queens of hastinap or queens of dwarka are lords uh, expansions of lord chit shakti but even when lord is dealing with uh, mundane people or mundane kings like uh, jarasan even there lord is not infected that's the point even in that case he remains like sun where he is completely uh, uh, although dealing with that uh, contaminated uh, matter contamination he is never contaminated rather he purifies that particular matter so in fact that's the point of the next verse but propad speaks it before only in this purport on talking about uh, lord dealing with infectious matter because this will not apply to the lords dealing with the queens you have to understand that this will not apply to the dealing with queens because queens are his uh, expansions of his chit shakti but this will apply to those who are mundane personalities and wh- who are they they are the envious kings or non devotees all such people so that's where this should be applied and that's the topic of next verse actually which propad uh, hints in his purport even before etadishanam ishasya prakritisthopi tadgunaihi na yujjate sadatmasthai yatha buddhis tadashraya this is the divinity of personality of godhead he is not affected by the qualities of material nature even though he is in contact with them similarly the devotees who have taken shelter of the lord do not become influenced by the material qualities so somebody may say that lord's dealings with his wives are fine they are chit shakti and it's accepted it's transcendental but what about the demons like jarasandha or all other demons where uh, we see that they are non devotees they they don't have anything to do with lord's uh, you know a uh, lot of sweet any other uh, people like that or uh, any other non devotee kings that lord deals with so what about them when he is dealing with them is he not contact with the material modes of nature that's that's the objection that's the akshepa and in order to answer this akshepa this verse is there you know so usually akshepa is is the objection that is happening Uh, between the two verses when you have to speak the next words 
naturally there's a thought process right why that verse has to be spoken so that verse's thought process the question that is underlying the verse is known as akshepa in the language of tika in the language of commentary nanu akshipati it's called nanu akshipati and that akshepa is actually given to us by uh, acharyas like shila vishwanath chakravarti shila jeev goswami shila swami and all of them you know so when you seriously deeply study shrimad bhagavatam try to understand that akshepa especially when uh, verses those who are trying to make philosophical points you know when it's a plain narrative there may not be any akshep but when philosophical points are made vishwanath chakravarti thakur takes a great trouble in presenting that akshep objection and then that objection is being answered in the verse you know so that's the point so here is uh, the, that kind of akshep that is lord not in contact with material modes of nature when he is dealing with completely mundane people so it is said no even in this manner when he is dealing with mundane people etad ishanam ishasya prakriti sthopi tad gunai na yujyate although he is dealing with material modes of nature na yujyate he is never affected by the material modes of nature because sadatmasthai those modes are always in him actually he is not in the modes the modes are his own energy and the modes are under his control completely he manifests those modes and he winds up those modes so that's so even when he is dealing with non devotees even when he is in touch with those who are completely mundane he is never uh, coming under the material modes of nature this has to be understood yatha buddhis tadashraya and for this drishtant is given that just as those who are taking shelter of the lord yatha buddhi literally speaking just as that intelligence which has taken the shelter of the lord although that intelligence being in the material world is never of the material world, devotee is consciousness a devotee who has taken shelter of the lord such a devotee even though staying in the material world is not affected by the modes of material world especially it's talking about the pure devotees of the lord so similarly it is said lord also dealing with the material world he is never affected by those modes so it is quite interesting that the drishtant is given of those who take shelter of the lord to make a point about the lord actually it it will be the other way round usually because you know devotees are dependent on the lord but here drishtant is given of the devotees to speak about the lord you know so that's a very you know peculiar way in the siddhant i mean in which drishtant is given that uh, it, it's it's something like this that uh, even lord's devotees who take his shelter even they are beyond modes of nature so what to speak of you know? so there is kind of kaimurti in this also that even uh, devotees are transcendental nirguna so what to speak of lord he is surely nirguna you know, in this particular man so propad just raises those objections in his purport if you see fourth line of the purport one may argue to that so he is exactly putting the akshep of vishwanath chakravarti thakur over there so sometimes he puts that in the purport sometimes he doesn't put that you know so if you are a reader of commentaries you would be able to also uh, take uh, see that akshep uh, you know which uh, vishwanath chakravarti thakur puts for most of the times like that and he also talks about the point of how lord's devotees are always beyond the material modes you know especially he talks about six gos swamis of the bhava like that. this particular manner okay this is this is the last verse now tam me nire abala modha strainam chanu vratam rah a pramana vido bhartur ishwaram mata yo yatha the simple and delicate women truly thought that lord shri krishna their beloved husband followed them and was dominated by them they were unaware of the extent of the glories of their husband and uh, of their husband as the atheists are unaware of him as the supreme controller okay so this is the last verse tam menire abala mudha 
स्तयनम चानो व्रतम रहा है सो एक्चुअली तम मेनिरे दे एक्सेप्टेड दिस लेडीज दिस क्वींस ऑफ द्वारका दे दे कंसीडर्ड द लॉर्ड एज स्तयन दे कंसीडर्ड हिम एज वन हु इज कंप्लीटली डोमिनेटेड बाय हिज वाइफ एंड अनुव्रतम रहा है and uh, one who is uh, just uh, going behind his wife you know always uh, i mean following her in the lonely place like like a strainer you know, like a man who is henpecked husband so they thought about the lord like that and that's why they are considered as moodha you know they are thought to be without knowledge or they were so simple they were very simple prophet says you know they thought like that अप्रमाण विदो भर्तु, because they didn't know the extent of the glories of their husband. ईश्वरम मतायो यथा, just as those who are atheist, Prabhupada says, or those who are theorizing all the time about ईश्वर, they remain actually completely uh, without knowing the extent of the glories of the Lord. Similarly, these women, these ladies. were also considering lord to be a strainer or uh, or uh, anuvratam raha so uh, did they consider lord like this yes they considered lord like this but uh, was it because of mahamaya or was it because of yoga maya that's the question so although they considered lord to be like a strainer is it it is not because of mahamaya that they considered him like that when they it is said a praman vidah they didn't know the extent of lord's glories that is by yoga maya and it is not by mahamaya these are the most exalted queens of the lord who are completely aware of the lord's glory they they know lord's aishwarya in and out they are pure devotees of the lord so when you say a praman vidah it is actually in terms of Although they know the extent of Lord's glories, by yoga maya they are covered in such a way that they don't know the Lord's glory. You understand? So that's why they are considered as moodha or without knowledge. Without knowledge because Lord wants them to be without knowledge. Because Lord out of yoga maya is putting them in knowledge. So actually they are most exalted. These ladies, you know, I mean, one wants to become a moodha like them. you understand this one wants to become a, a praman vidho like them because they are a praman vidha and they are without knowledge they are moodha by lord's yoga maya potency by their great love and their reciprocation with the lord they are being put under yoga maya to think lord like this so it's it's their glorification actually it's a first class glorification of these uh, queens of dwarka you know, when it is said like that so because otherwise madhurya ras would not uh, happen right if they all the time remembered lord's uh, exaltedness in terms of uh, you know the uh, in terms of his he being the source of all that exists and all that so although they they have the aishwarya bhav it is surely there that they are not like vraj gopis who who just uh, who are completely always under yoga maya that lord is actually uh, just their lover but these ladies do remember uh, aishwarya but still uh, in those intimate dealings with the lord lord also by his yoga maya made them forget about his uh, great prowess as uh, as ishwara you know and and they literally thought that uh, lord is uh, you know is so much controlled by you know their sweet dealings and by their glances and by their you know beautiful uh, sweet past times that they are having with the lord you know so this is their prema and lord is controlled by that prema so for the exchange of rasa what was lord doing is he was putting them in yoga maya but because of which they forgot that position of the lord they used to forget and then they used to also remember and then they used to forget and again they used to remember so it's like this for queens of dwarka but especially with the gopis with yashoda mai with the vraj gopas lords uh, all the devotees in vrindavan it's it's just that this realization of lord aishwarya never comes to them you know even when uh, great sages talk to them about lords uh, being supreme lord and all you know they hear it and and they they disbelieve it they feel is it really so you know he he is ishwara 
and then Yashoda Mai thinks, uh, how is he Ishwara? When he sees the lightning in the sky, he comes uh, and runs and hides himself in my sari. You know, he, he comes and hides himself. Uh, he embraces me and he's so much shaking with fear. You know? So Yashoda Mai feels that what they are telling, I, I can't believe this, he is Ishwara. So you understand because of her prema, this never ever uh, uh, this uh, realization comes to them that he is Ishwara. But with the Dwarka queens, you know, especially in terms of their intimate dealings, Lord makes them uh, forget these uh, uh, prophecies of him uh, under Yoga Maya. But uh, we should know that uh, this particular Madhurya is also uh, just like there is Gaurav Sakya uh, and there is Vishrambha Sakya. You know, Sakharas is also of two kinds. One is of uh, thinking Lord always as the friend and never ever remembering his Ishwaratva and Vishramba Sakya in which time to time there is also a reminder of Lord being the Lord, Lord being the Ishwara. So something similar is also there in case of uh, Dwarka's queens. This is the Siddhanta that uh, Shivaji Goswami explains in Prithi. Okay, so that's all uh, that is there in, about the words. Prabhupada also puts this point in purport. You know, he says about uh, how by yoga maya potency, Lord performs pastimes in his uh, uh, five different rasas and he puts his devotees in yoga maya like that. You know? So very crystal clear, uh, he says towards the end of the purport that wives of Lord uh, Krishna were made to forget the immeasurable glories of the Lord by the internal potency. So that there might not be any flaw of exchange, and they took it for granted that Lord was a henpecked husband, always them in lonely places. So you see, if if Lord's uh, pastime service is so difficult to be understood by his most exalted uh, devotees, uh, even they are put into yoga maya. So what to speak of those who are uh, uh, mental speculators, atheists, matayah, matis? All those matis who are, uh, Prabhupada says, uh, they are always theorizing about what is the cause of creation and how Lord is upadan karan, how Lord is, uh, uh, you know, material cause upadan karan, or how his nimitta karan, the instrumental cause, or how Lord is remote cause, or how Lord is the ultimate cause, the four kinds of causation. You know, they are theorizing all that, but how much do they really know about Lord's persona, Lord's personality and his sweet dealings and his bewildering his most exalted devotees with yoga maya. So they are actually uh, a praman vidaha because of uh, not having the perfect knowledge and Lord's devotees are a praman vidaha by having perfect knowledge one is out of Mahamaya and another is out of Yoga Maya. So that's the difference. The same Bhakti Vedan purports of the first canto, 11th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Lord Krishna's Entrance into Dwarak. So this is where we end for uh, as far as this chapter is concerned. So I would like to take a pause here and uh, I'll check if there are any questions in whatever we discussed in the last part. Yes, Prabhu, any questions? Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Balabhadra uh, Kapapabhu, are there any questions to devotees? No, Prabhuji. Okay, fine. So, I think it's all uh, uh, very clear and understandable. So, fine, Prabhu. So, what we are going to do is now we will begin with the next chapter, which is chapter 12. And uh, this chapter is actually uh, one chapter in which there is not much uh, discussion on philosophy. Uh, it is more about Emperor Parikshit's birth. So I'm going to go a bit fast in this chapter. We will not have much. Uh, of course, Prabhupada does write long purports in this chapter. But those purports are primarily to introduce various personalities or to introduce various uh, episodes that are there in this uh, particular uh, chapter. Like Prabhupada introduces 
people, various people, you know, whenever there is discussion of kings or uh, any any particular kings, any particular personalities, when Parikshit is being glorified uh, as compared to different personalities like Shibi, like uh, uh, you know, many other personalities, it comes. So uh, that's how he just introduces these characters because. Uh, um, this is Canto first, and you know that uh, all these pastimes uh, uh, were uh, many of the pastimes were given by Prabhupada in terms of Krishna book when he wrote the summary study of tenth Canto. So that's when uh, many of the pastimes became known to the, especially to the Western world. So before that, Prabhupada wrote first Canto. So in first Canto, he is introducing many many personalities. You have seen that even before. Whenever discussion of Munis comes, like who is Gautama, who is Bharadwaj, or who is, uh, you know, even personalities like Shukadev and all that, he introduces all of them because uh, sometimes uh, these pastimes and all that, uh, may, many of us may not be aware of this. So that's how uh, these purports are long. But otherwise, yeah, the discussion uh, is actually quite uh, brief and more like a narrative of Parikshit's birth. So this is uh, chapter 12, birth of Emperor Parikshit. And uh, if we go to the karika of this verse, uh, uh, this, this particular chapter, sorry. So the karika reads like this. Pratva janmotsavam raja pautrasya shri parikshitaha dvadashe bhavi tadvrittam vipraya ruptam upashranon janmotsavam kritva raja so this chapter discusses about Janmotsava of Parikshit, uh, Parikshit's uh, birth and uh, the festivities that followed Parikshit's birth. Dvadashe uh, Bhavi Tadvrittam also spoken is the future predictions about Parikshit. So that's the major section of this chapter in which Parikshit is, uh, Parikshit's activities and his qualities are prophesied. They are told at his Jatakarma, they are told by great exalted Brahmana sages beforehand how Parikshit will be. So that is Bhavi Tadvrittam, Vipraya Ruptam Upashranot. So this Yudhishthir, he heard this uh, prophecies about uh, Parikshit from the uh, mouths of all the Brahmanas. So that's the major topic actually, uh, Parikshit's birth the festivities and the predictions that happen for Parikshit. So that's all the three sections are there primarily. Naiva Shruta Charo Bhakto, again one more verse Vishwanath Chakravati writes for this. Naiva Shruta Charo Bhakto Raja Vatava Jidrishaha Krishnam Dadarsha Yogarbhe Yascha Kalima Dandayat. This kind of king is never heard actually. One who was such an exalted devotee and king in this chapter you will get to hear about his great devotion as well as his great qualities as a king so as a as a devotee he was such a mahabhagavad that he see lord krishna in his garbha he see lord krishna personally in his garbha itself uh, in his garbha means when he was in garbha in uttara's garbha yascha kalim adandayat and also he uh, punished chastised Kali himself, you know, we, we hear about chastisement of evil kings, but here is a person who is the chastiser of, uh, you know, the king of all evil kings, that is Sakshat Kali. So that was his great activity. So this is what uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says. Fine. So first three verses talk about one, two, three, they talk about Shonaka's inquiries about Parikshit's birth. And the uh, next three verses will talk about Yudhishthir. So that's uh, first three and Nekovacha. Ashvatham no patrashtena Brahmashit Shnoru Tejasa Uttaraya Hato Garbha Ishena Jivita Punaha. The sage Shonaka said, the womb of Uttara, mother of Maharaj Parikshit, was spoiled by the dreadful and invincible Brahmastra weapon released by Ashwatthama. But Maharaj Parikshit was saved by the Supreme Lord. So Ashwatthama had actually uh, uh, sent the Brahmastra 
and the uttaraya hato garbha it is said actually parikshit was uh, killed by that brahmastra he was literally uh, destroyed by that brahmastra dagdha he was burnt by that brahmastra but then lord krishna brought him back to life actually he, he literally protected him in the womb and he brought him back to life so this is uh, 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 the special favor done by the lord so why is uh, shonak speaking this because if you remember originally the one of the four questions that they had asked was about parikshit's birth right in the fourth chapter we discussed after asking the questions kasmin yuge pravrtyam sthane va kena hetuna you know why was this bhagavatam in what way it was compiled then the next question was uh, one of the next questions was about parikshit's birth and activities so in order to describe parikshit's birth and activities so many topics were discussed uh, you know ashwatthama's uh, punishment was discussed and then uh, uttara we see that uttara's uh, being attacked by the brahmastra was discussed and lord's protecting her then kunti's prayers yudhishthir stopping the lord then yudhishthir being pacified by bhishma and then uh, you know lord leaving for leaving hastinapur and arriving in dwaraka his dealings with his beloved wives so many things were discussed but parikshit's birth itself which was the question asked that was not so much specifically discussed right so shonak is asking and bringing that uh, topic back to the question of uh, parikshit's birth of course they were most ecstatic to hear all these topics but their originally inquire original inquiry uh, you know they brought back by asking about parikshit's birth so here is what uh, they are saying please explain uh, you know all this activities of parikshit's birth and his activities text 2 tasya janma mahabuddhe karmani cha mahatmana nidhanam cha yathaiva sit sapratyaga how was the great emperor parikshit who was highly intelligent and great devotee born in that womb how did his death take place and what did he achieve after his death so they are asking now all these questions reiterating how was he born how did his death take place nidhanam and what was his destination that he achieved after his death so they want to hear about parikshit uh, activities and also parikshit's uh, 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 departure like that so yes so proper talks about uh, how uh, he says about how this parikshit nidhanam parikshit's uh, departure so proper tells about how parikshit received that curse you know from uh, this uh, rishi uh, shringi rishi's son and proper is telling that how parikshit was capable enough to counteract the curse but he accepted it you know parikshit was on parikshit thinking if i was protected by the lord in the womb then if lord really wanted to protect me he would have protected me even in this situation but the very fact that he has allowed this curse to be falling on me it's it it's clear that lord wants me to depart it is his plan that i should depart and the age of kali should take over so this was pikshit's uh, thought actually where he thought that the same lord who protected me in the womb he could have also saved me uh, from the curse of the brahmana's son but because he was a pure devotee so he thought that the lord is not uh, doing that so that's how i accept this curse as his desire and he became ready to depart from this world so this is actually the symptom of uh, the age of kali where propat says his brahman community's degradation began shring is reckless behavior in terms of uh, cursing the emperor of the whole world is actually beginning of downfall of all the uh, brahmanas tadidam shrotum ichchamo gaditum yadi manyase bruhina shabda dhana nam yasya jnanam adach shukah so whatever he spoke in two verses shubhde uh, sorry shonaka 
he says that tadidam shrotu michhamo so we want to hear all this you know gaditum yadi vanya se you know if you wish to narrate this if you accept that uh, this should be narrated bruhinah shraddhana nam we are all your faithful and very respectful audience and please tell us uh, you know about this parikshit and all these activities whom uh, the siddev goswami delivered the knowledge of bhagavatam when he was cursed uh, um, by the curse of the brahmana's son <clears throat> so in this manner so prabhupad talks about uh, speaking about shukdev and parikshit he says that both of them are the examples of uh, shukdev is the example of kirtanam and parikshit is the perfect uh, example of uh, uh, shravanam so there are nine processes of devotional service navavidha navavidha bhakti nine limbs of devotional service and uh, these nine each one of them uh, has also a prototype devotee who manifests or rather who exemplifies that particular aspect so we know that uh, parikshit is actually example of shravanam and shukdev goswami is example of kirtanam so this is a very perfect combination of guru disciple and uh, that's how this samvad took place in uh, this uh, great guru and great disciple prabhupad says that uh, this is middle of the purport uh, this relationship is much different from relationship of ma- spiritual master and disciple in the material world especially in age of kali he says it is said that the master this is kali yuga's uh, master spiritual master and disciple it is said that the master injects spiritual force into the disciple by an electrical current generated by the master and the disciple begins to feel the shock okay so this was happening <laughs> and this is still happening such things master is giving electric current and disciple is feeling shock he becomes unconscious disciple becomes unconscious and the master weeps for his exhausting his store of so called spiritual assets such bogus advertisement is going on in this age and the poor common man is becoming the victim of such advertisement we do not find such folk tales proper says folk tales in the dealings of shukdev goswami and his great disciple maharaj parikshit so in a very uh, uh, very eloquent words proper exposes the folly of you know modern days uh, guru disciple fashion actually that kind of guru you know and that kind of disciple where uh, they feel that guru gives a shock and disciple receives the shock and after guru gives shock he feels that he has lost his energy so he starts crying this is such a bogus uh, understanding of guru disciple and prop says uh, we don't have such folk tales lok katha <laughs> in the shrimad bhagavatam in shukdev goswami and maharaj parikshit actually means only such fools will be uh, only fools will be impressed by such things actually but we see that so kind so many kind of such pseudo guru gurus are there and people are madly behind them just just for getting some kind of shock by their embrace or by feeling cool cold you know <laughs> proper used to say why you have to feel cold by embracing your guru you can sit in the refrigerator and you and feel the cold so this is how that so but the real uh, process of guru disciple relationship is actually ardent hearing from the bona fide master proper says the last line ardent hearing from the bona fide master is the only way to receive transcendental knowledge so we don't look for some uh, so called miraculous uh, uh, effect in guru's association or by guru's touch actually the miracle will happen if we hear subjectively the guru the miraculous effect will take the guru doesn't have to show any miracle to us you know like so many kind of occult mystic miracles that people feel are important but actually most important thing is the guru is self realized and the disciple hears from him uh, in a very eager manner so this process is simple but point is uh, the party has to be sincere prabhupada says the disciple has to be sincere 
it's a simple process but for a sincere person if somebody is crooked then this simple process will not uh, appeal to such a person so after this sud goswami speaks three verses about yudhishthir why does he speak about yudhishthir because vishma chakravarti thakur says that uh, the cause to achieve such a grandson like parikshit was actually yudhishthir's attachment to lord krishna anurag because yudhishthir had such a great affection for the lord anurag that's why such a grandson was received by him lord protected his grandson so this is why the discussion of yudhishthir is coming up because yudhishthir was the reason because of which uh, i mean primarily yudhishthir was so much loved by the lord that lord didn't want yudhishthir's dynasty to be dynasty to be dynasty to be without any heir so that's the point suta uvacha api palad dharma raja pitruvad ranjayan praja nispruha sarva kamebhya krishna pada anu sevaya shri sud goswami said emperor yudhishthir administered generously to everyone during his reign he was exactly like his father he had no personal ambition and was freed from all sorts of sense gratification because of his continuous service unto the lord spirit of lord shri krishna so yudhishthir was so wonderful that he protected apipalat palayamas apipalat means he protected he took care of his praja like pitruvat like a father and he was completely devoid of any desire for sense gratification sarva kamebhya nispraha why because he was always engaged in krishna's uh, serving krishna's lotus feet krishna pada anu sevaya so yudhishthir was so exalted that uh, uh, although he had the greatest of kingdoms he never desired any sense gratification because he was always absorbed in service to lord shri krishna so this is the special uh, prerogative uh, this is the special quality of yudhishthir so what proper does in purport is he explains the word praja and he also explains the word krishna pada uh, what is that krishna pada anu sevaya yes so praja means everybody who is born in the kingdom that's how praja doesn't mean only humans but also means the lower animals proper says it's not like modern and modern people's understanding where they think that lower animals are not given any protection while the higher animals are given so called protection <laughs> so proper doesn't say human beings he says higher animals are given protections you know why higher animals because they don't protect lower animals so they are not humans but higher animals like that you know and also he says that uh, uh, parikshit uh, sorry yudhishthir was most exalted because of his krishna pada anu sevaya he was the most perfect man in the world because of his knowing the science of krishna propat says in the middle of the purport by knowing the science of krishna one can become the most perfect man in the world and unless one has knowledge in this science all qualifications and doctorate diplomas acquired by academic education are spoiled and useless right so by knowing science of krishna consciousness we become the most perfect man the most complete man so you don't become a complete man by wearing raymond suit but you become most perfect or complete man by knowing the science of krishna consciousness that's the point and uh, that's the glory of uh, shri yudhishthir maharaj suprapad so speaks about this okay two more verses about yudhishthir sampada krita vo loka mahishi dhrataro mahi जम्बुदीपाधिपत्यंचुदिवेशल that his it is said yashah atri divam gatam you know that actually his fame reached to all the heavenly planets also all the three worlds bhur bhuva swah it reached why because he had such great opulence sampadah 
कृतव सच सैक्रिफाइस अश्वमेध सैक्रिफाइस राजसूय ही परफॉर्म दैट हिज फेम रीच far and wide and also his uh, further destinations were fixed because he had done such great sacrifices so in terms of the sacrifices avoiding those particular planets uh, celestial planets krutavo loka that is referring to that sacrifices and the planets his mahishi you know his queen draupadi how she was the most exalted uh, jiboti and the most beautiful uh, wife of uh, yudhishthir so her fame was also you know just uh, so much far and wide and this is how uh, yudhishthir was also glorified bhrataraha yudhishthir's brothers also were very well known all the pandavas and their great prowess in fact arjuna was so powerful that even you know uh, all the devas respected arjuna and they knew that uh, he is even uh, summoned by indra and he has he has helped indras by killing nivat kavacha and all those demons so you know so such was the greatness of uh, especially bhima and arjuna and all the pandavas as such mahi you know his uh, rule over the entire earth jambudvipa adhipatyancha and his sovereignty over the entire planet earth Uh, you know it was like literally like uh, sovereignty over entire jambudvipa you know vamshidhar says that uh, uh, because bharat khanda is considered the most uh, important on jambudvipa so although yudhishthir was ruling over the entire of bharat khanda because bharat khanda is the most important part of jambudvipa so jambudvipa adhipatyam is also spoken here so in this manner his uh, fame pa- reached uh, far and wide and it reached three divam you know it reached all the three worlds like that so prabhupada also addresses these things in uh, uh, in his purport so on the other side prabhupada takes the point is specially about the loka he says that there are sacrifices which award the celestial planets the higher planets but but the modern man doesn't want to perform any sacrifices but he wants to go to this higher planets by just uh, uh, you know making this mechanical devices this uh, spaceships spaceships and uh, sputnik and all such uh, uh, satellites so propad says no forceful entrance is allowed in such planets you know one may think that uh, by our uh, you know gadgets and by our spaceships we will be able to enter higher planets but propad says nobody can enter into outer space on such planets in some contraptions like this kim te kama sura sparha mukunda mana sodvija adhijahur mudam radnya kshuditasya yakhetare O oh, Brahmana, the opulence of the king was so enchanting that the denizens of heaven aspired for it. But because he was absorbed in the service of the Lord, nothing could satisfy him except the Lord's service. So this is exceptional quality of Yudhishthir. Ah, uh, although his uh, the bhogas that he had, the objects of uh, so to say sense enjoyment that he had, which were spoken in the prior verses, they were sura sparha. they were actually uh, even desired by demigods even demigods desired the kind of opulence and the uh, objects of vaibhava that the yudhishthir maharaj had but uh, you know sud goswami is uh, asking this question kim te kama radnyah mukund manasah uh, mudam adhijahu so he is asking the question what do you think did those all objects of sense gratification uh, create a pleasure or offered a pleasure to this king whose mind was always at the lotus feet of uh, king lotus feet of mukund did those objects give him pleasure so no they didn't give he is saying it's a rhetorical question so they did they give any pleasure no they did, did, didn't give any pleasure because shudhisat shuditasya yathetare because he was actually hungry for something else he was not hungry for objects of sense gratification 
so if somebody is hungry and if you give him itare if you give him srap chandanadi you know somebody is very hungry and you bring him nice chandan with camphor and everything and put on his forehead and say that are you happy well he is hungry you do something about his hunger no you offer him a very fresh garland it might be good but finally what he wants is uh, the, that his hunger should be fulfilled so he will not be satisfied really till his hunger is fulfilled so similarly yudhishthir maharaj although he received all his wonderful objects of uh, his great opulence actually he was only he would be only happy with the lord's service and lord's association you know that was what he was hungry for he was not hungry for either of the objects of sense gratification so this is his yudhishthir special uh, position although he had such great opulence actually none of the objects of his opulence really pleased him because such was his absorption in lord service and lord's uh, lotus feet that he he was hungry for only that and nothing else so prabhupada speaks about two kinds of living beings in this world one is hungry for sense gratification and another is hungry for loving service of the lord so those are the two kinds of uh, living beings uh, one want to be servant of the lord another wants to be enjoyer so that's why there is sense gratification on one side and devotional service those who aspire for it they are on the other side like that but actually real hunger should be of the hunger of spirit only prabhupad says that the real hunger is actually the spiritual hunger spiritual food spiritual shelter spiritual defense and spiritual sense gratification you know like that so the real need is not ahar nidra bhaya maithuna you know actually it is uh, the transcendental uh, you know lord's association and also the transcendental services of the lord so from that perspective and if we are connecting and utilizing it in service of the lord then the hunger can be for food that is spiritual food spiritual shelter spiritual defense and spiritual sense gratification so from that angle the real hunger is that and this hunger will be only fulfilled when we come in touch with the lord so that's about uh, yudhishthir's uh, glorification by sud goswami and now he starts explaining about the birth of emperor parikshit you know the actual topic the subject at uh, at hand you know prastutam stauti whatever is to be prastuta uska stuvan karte hai means what is to be presented now he starts speaking like that matur garbhagato veera satada bhrugunandana ददर्श पुरुषम कश्चि दह्यमानो स्त्रते जसा ओसन भृगु शौनक व्हेन द चाइल्ड परीक्षित द ग्रेट फाइटर वाज इन द वोम्ब ऑफ हिज मदर उत्तरा एंड वाज सफरिंग फ्रॉम द बर्निंग हीट ऑफ द ब्रह्मास्त्र शोन बाय अश्वत्थामा ही कुड ऑब्जर्व द सुप्रीम लॉर्ड कमिंग टू हिम सो दिस इज अ मातुर गर्भगतो वीर सो दिस इज बीइंग टॉक्ड अबाउट व्हाट वाज द पोजीशन ऑफ परीक्षित व्हेन ही वाज इन द वोम्ब ऑफ Uh, his mother so there also he is called as veera because acharyas do explain or even prabhupad explains uh, his in his purport yes he explains in the last uh, per- line of the purport that actually although seeing that great heat of the seeing and experiencing the great heat of that brahmastra this child parikshit because naturally he was a veera he was a great warrior great fighter so he was not uh, uh, fearful and he endured the unbearable temperature that was there in the womb of his mother you know at that point when he was being burnt by this astra teja you know he was able to saw a personality dadarsha purusham so he saw one very special personality coming towards him like that so this was uh, none other than the supreme lord who was coming to protect him so we remember that uh, when ashwatthama had released a brahmastra so that brahmastra split into uh, two parts so 
five different arrows went to kill Pandavas, and one arrow uh, was actually heading towards Uttara's garb, uh, Uttara's womb to kill Parikshit within the womb. So Lord, by his Sudarshana, he uh, he nullified all those Brahmastras, but by he himself entered, the Lord himself entered in the womb of Uttara and he started protecting the um, Garbha Parikshit uh, from this uh, great Brahmastra like that. So actually why did he enter Parik uh, Uttara's Garbha was actually to give Darshan to Parikshit. He could have even saved the Parikshit by being outside of the womb. It was possible for the Lord. What is impossible for him? But he entered in the womb of the uh, Uttara just to give darshan to Parikshit. That was the reason. You know, he entered uh, into Garbha of Uttara. Like that. So, how was that Lord? His darshan is spoken in this next verse. Angushta matra mamalam spurat purata maulinam apivya darshanam shamam tadidvasa samachutam he, the Lord, was only a thumb high, but he was all transcendental. He had a very beautiful, blackish, infallible body, and he wore a dress of lightning yellow and a helmet of blazing gold. Thus he was seen by the child. Yes. So this is... Yeah, so this is talking about Lord in the womb of uh, Queen, uh, in, the, uh, in the womb of Uttara. So Lord took a form which is just Angushta Matram. He, he took a form that was having a measure of a thumb. And that form was completely transcendental. Lord was also wearing a very beautiful helmet which was just uh, dazzling. You know, Spurata Paurata Maulinam. And he was very, very beautiful to look at because he was looking like a black cloud that is along with uh, lightning. That lightning was actually his Pitambar uh, Vasasam Achutam. So, this darshan of the Lord, the child did, uh, child means Parikshit in the womb, he was able to uh, take the darshan of this Lord. Shrimad Dirgha Chatur Bahum Tapta Kanchana Kundalam Shatajaksham Gadapanim Atmana Sarvat Odisham Paribramantam Ulkabham Brahma Yantam Gadam Mohu. The Lord was encircled and the Lord was enriched with four hands, earrings of molten gold, and eyes blood red with fury. As he loitered about, his club constantly encircled him like a shooting star. So the point is. When Lord was inside uh, the womb of Uttara, so what was Lord doing there? See, Lord's description is going on, and in that it is said, Srimad Dirgha Chatur Bahum. He had very long forearms and Tapta Kanchana Kundalam, and he was having uh, earrings which were of which were molten gold looking. I mean that that kind of Kanti was there, like a molten gold. And Kshatajaksham, it is said. Lord was having very great anger in his eyes. His eyes were bloodshot. There was redness of blood in his eyes. Why was this? Because he was very angry at the Brahmastra and uh, at, uh, uh, at Ashwatthama who had released the Brahmastra. So entering into the womb, Lord, what he started doing is he was taking his gada and he was revolving around him continuously. He was rotating that gada continuously around him. Lord himself was actually moving about. Paribrahmantam and the gada, he was Brahmayantam. The gada was uh, being, the gada was being uh, hurled by him. Uh, rather, not hurled, but uh, the gada was being rotated by him in all the directions, again and again and again, like that. So he was countering all the uh, Teja 
of that particular uh, brahmastra by his gada so actually lord was protecting parikshit by gada you know because his sudarshan was already uh, uh, employed in the push his gada to protect this uh, child you know personally uh, rotating and encircling that gada so that uh, the brahmastra doesn't take effect in this particular man so vishwanath chakravarti thakur has the opinion that although lord was uh, manifested in a form of thumb size but he says parikshit actually observed the lord yathavat pramanam he observed the lord in his original dimension although lord took a form which was appropriate for the form in the womb that is of a thumb size but parikshit saw him in his original dimension means in lord's yathavat praman uh, yathavat pramanam lord uh, saw him in his original features and in his original dimensions otherwise vishwanath chakravarti thakur's uh, argument is it would not have been possible for parikshit to look for the same person in the people of this world if if you see something which is very small like a thumb size uh vishwanath chakravarti thakur says that for him to be able to see and visualize that particular form in the men of the world would not be possible so he actually saw him saw the lord like uh, like like a full grown man like how lord was and that's how when he was seeing every man in this world then he used to do that parikshan whether this is the person who protected me in the womb and then he would say no no this is not the person like that so in this particular man you know okay so propad also refers to these ideas you know he says that uh, by inconceivable potency lord was able to be in the womb of uttara and take up a form of uh, angushtha matram that is only a form of uh, one thumb like that and he says that this is lord's inconceivable nature a chinta shakti by which he can uh, appear in a form that is very suitable for his devotees he takes the discussion further in terms of archa vigraha archa vigraha is also that form of the lord in which lord uh, enables himself to appear in a material form like lord comes in the form of a wood or in the form of a marble stone he appears himself in that particular form so this is by his inconceivable arrangement that although he is in this particular material form lord remains completely transcendent you know he is he doesn't become material by appearing in a material form no he remains transcendent that's the philosophy of uh, deity right although that form is material but actually it's not material it is completely transcendental and that can be understood by serving that form and by meditating on that form one will also be able to get rid of material afflictions material attractions so if the form was material how was that somebody will be able to get rid of material attractions so that's why the deity form of the lord the archa vigraha form of the lord although appearing in material form it's most it's it's transcendental that's the point propad also speaks in the context of achinta shakti why achinta shakti discussion because lord had appeared in the form of uh in in the size of a thumb uh, by his achinta shakti okay astra teja swagadaya niharam eva gopati vidamantam sannikarshe paryekshatva ityaso so in this manner just as okay translation the lord was thus engaged in vanquishing the radiation of the brahmastra just as the sun evaporates a drop of dew he was observed by the child who thought about who he was yes so that particular astra teja that particular uh great heat of the brahmastra that lord vanquished by his gada just as sun vanquishes the drops of the dew niharam eva gopati gopati here means sun 
and niharam means uh, the drops of dew so sun it dissipates all the drops of dew so similarly by his gada lord was able to dissipate the entire uh, temperature or the heat or the effulgence of that particular brahmastra and uh, the child was observing all this that is the parikshit was observing all this and he was just considering observing kaitya sa who is this person who is actually trying to save me who is this person like that he was thinking so shri vishwan chakravarti thapur says in this verse there is the word okay, no not for this yeah yeah yes so uh, basically yes in this verse only the discussion is about how parikshit was actually examining this person that who is he and he is uh, so expertly uh, saving me from this uh, brahmastra like that विधु ये यात्मा भगवान धर्म गुप विभु मिशदो दशमा तत्रेवान्तर्दधे हरि बीइंग ऑब्जर्व्ड बाय द चाइल्ड द सुप्रीम लॉर्ड पर्सनालिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड द सुपर सोल ऑफ एवरीवन एंड द प्रोटेक्टर ऑफ राइचस हु स्ट्रेचेस इन ऑल डायरेक्शंस एंड हु इज अनलिमिटेड बाय टाइम एंड स्पेस डिसअपियर्ड एट वंस सो इन दिस मैनर दैट तेज दैट astrateja uh, vidhuya he lord caused that all that astrateja to be uh, removed to be vanished and ameyatma lord is said to be ameyatma so he is actually all pervading super soul proper translates and dharma gup vibhu he is the protector of all the dharma especially bhakta vatsalya he is his greatest dharma so after protecting this uh, particular person parikshit in his womb what he did mishato dashamasasya tatrevantar dhade hari so lord hari when the child was seeing you know mishato dashamasasya there itself lord disappeared it is said like that dashamasasya can uh, apply to parikshit who was at that time acharya say 10 months in his uh, uh, in his mother's womb 10 months so uttara has been pregnant for 10 months at that particular point that is one meaning of dashamasasya and prabhupad also gives another meaning of dashamasasya in which he applies this to lord who is dressed in all four uh, all 10 directions so usually dressed by all four directions means somebody who is not dressed up at all but dashamasasya here in case of lord means actually one who is controller of all the 10 directions so it's like uh, all 10 directions are uh, under his he is present in all that direction so such a lord immediately disappeared from there from the point where he had appeared he also disappeared there so hari word is used vishwanath chakravarti thakur says that the significance of hari word is that actually hari you know सर्व मंगल हरि हरे प्रेम दिया हरे मन चैतन्य चरित एक्सप्लेन्स हरि शब्द नानार्थ तई त्र मुख्य दुईतम त्र दुई मुख्यतम सॉरी सो देर आर मेनी मीनिंग्स ऑफ हरि बट टू आर द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट व्हाट इज सर्व मंगल हरे सो लॉर्ड हरि टेक्स अवे ऑल इन ऑस्पिशियसनेस एंड prem diya hare man and by giving the love of his lotus feet he uh, captures he steals the heart of his devotee so actually vishwanath chakravarti thakur says hari word is used in this verse because lord came just to steal the heart of parikshit he, he came for that sole purpose of stealing the heart of parikshit you know it was like a kuta yamika he says kuta yamika is like a Night thief, a thief that uh, uh, then steals the thing and disappears. So similarly, Lord came very silently. He appeared and he also stole the heart, the mind of Parikshit, and left from there. So this is the significance of the special word Hari in this particular verse, like that. 
so proper explains all these words especially he explains uh, amayatma and also uh, lords being unlimited in time and space you know the antar dadhe dashamasasya all these words proper explains in his purport so now parikshit's uh, birth is described you know after this protection tata sarvaguna dharke sanukula graho daye jadne vamshadhara pandor bhuya pandor de vov chasa thereupon when all the good signs of the zodiac gradually evolved the ear apparent of pandu who would be exactly like him in prowess took birth so then uh, after this uh, we see that when the perfect time was there for appearance of parikshit sarva guno darke means actually such a time or at which if parikshit takes birth he will be bedecked with all wonderful qualities in future so when such anukul uh, time the planet's position came about you know this great uh, person who was going to be the ear apparent the next uh, a king of all of of this pandu vamshas of pandu he took birth you know and he was also like uh, great having great powers like the pandu himself king pandu the father of pandavas so this personality parikshit appeared at such an opportune time like that so prabhupada in purport talks about uh, the astrology how it's a perfect science and he says that uh, by performing the proper samskaras one can actually take the uh, take the benefit of all these uh, different positions of the planets if one performs uh, very perfect uh, uh, samskaras then we see that for such a person <clears throat> uh, there is a very proper position of the planets that is created like these sanskaras typically even start from garbhadan i mean before the child uh, is born before the child is conceived actually garbhadan is the sanskar of conception so in order to have the child very good qualities it all begins right from the time of conception so he is saying that if somebody does those right sanskaras then the person will also receive those wonderful qualities like that and uh, the best of constellations they appear when lord krishna is going to take the appearance take the birth lord's uh, birth is marked by the best of constellations and that's how jayanti should be reserved only for the lord that auspicious constellation is known as when lord takes birth is known as jayanti but we see that jayanti word is just uh, very common you know any politician and any other person people say this and this man's jayanti so proper says we should not abuse word jayanti for such purposes it's an abuse of the word jayanti it's it's actually only uh, left for the great uh, appearance of supreme lord in this particular so all these samskaras they are very important part of varnashrama and proper in this as well as next verse speaks about this importance of all these uh, dashavid samskaras sometimes also shodashi samskara uh, spoken in the smritis in a very detailed tasya pritamana raja viprayar dhomya kripa dibih jatakam tarayama sa vachaitva cha mangalam king yudhishthir who was very satisfied with the birth of maharaj parikshit had the purificatory process of birth performed learned brahmanas headed by dhomya and kripa recited auspicious hymns so king yudhishthir was extremely pleased to have a, a son to have actually a grandson but he was the son of his uh, dynasty so from that angle it is like putrotsava you know although he was the grandson he was the son of abhimanyu who was arjuna's son but uh, the king yudhishthir because parikshit was the ear apparent so that's why he became most delighted and then as soon as uh, that uh, the parikshit was born the jatakarma was done 
when that uh, umbilical cord is uh, cut uh, after that jata karma is uh, performed so jata karma was done by this great uh, sages or the great priests like dhaumya and like kripacharya you know, kripacharya was a great martial uh, general as well as a great uh, brahmana very expert in all the vedic sanskaras and sacrifices and dhaumya was the obviously the royal priest so, so they assisted by uh, all the brahmanas they performed uh, jata karma for uh, parikshit and uh, mangalam was sung for him swasti vachan was done and jata karma was performed you know mahabharata does mention about kripacharya being extremely uh, expert at reciting all the vedic hymns and uh, vedic stotras and swasti vachanas and all that because he was actually son of sharadvan you know uh, he was son of a great brahman named sharadvan like that so prabhupad speaks about the need of uh, intelligent class of brahmanas who are expert in performing all those samskaras so quite uh, quite uh, uh, appropriate for prabhupad to bring up uh, that in purport because we see that uh, qualified brahmanas are so much lacking in kaliyuga and that's how there is a great need of vaishnav brahmanas to perform the appropriate rites as per uh, vaishnava vidhi you know otherwise we see that uh, uh, even for vaishnavas often times uh, uh, the the vidhis many different samskaras have to be done by uh, karmakandi brahmanas and all that but actually uh, shila gopal bhat goswami does recommend very much the vaishnav vidhi of all the dashavid uh, dashavid samskaras all other samskaras too so prabhupad says that's why we need expert brahmanas in our movement and this is part of the varnashrama that he wanted always to establish of course we want to establish the pancharatriki system of brahmanas and not the vaidiki because in uh, vaidik system we see that uh, it's primarily based upon the birth while pancharatrik system acts even on the shudras and by the process of uh, diksha vidhi vidhanena diksha vidhanena by the process of diksha vidhi even the shudras can be turned into brahmanas so that's the practical process for uh, spiritual uh, upliftment in kali yuga and this is accepted by all the great acharyas of the vaishnav sampradayas so prabhupad does speak about kripacharya in the purport uh, typically how he is going to speak about many other personalities also uh, in this particular uh, chapter so we move ahead hiranyam gam mahim graman hastashwandra patirvaran radhasvannam ch vibhritya prajatirthe satirtha vit upon the birth of a son the king who knew how where and when charity should be given gave gold land villages elephants horses and good food grains to the brahmanas so when uh, yudhishthira was so delighted by having a uh, great devotee like parikshit appear you know so prajatirthe means putrotpatti punya kale so when this great son was born of the dynasty so at this particular point he he with a great delighted heart he gave so much of charity to charity to brahmanas you know he gave gold he gave cows land and then elephants horses and uh, very good food grains he distributed them in abundant qualities in quantities to all the vipras and he is called yudhishthira is said to be tirtha with one who actually knew when the charity and where the charity is to be given so he knew that the charity has to be given to actually devotee brahmanas the brahmanas uh, who are qualified brahmanas and not to any uh, apatra person so the right person should be given right charity whom to give and what to give actually brahmanas only the brahmanas and sanyasis are authorized to accept charity from the householders he says that so they they are uh, uh, allowed to accept the charity in this particular manner uh also prabhupad speaks about the word tirthavat 
saying that charity should be given only in the appropriate uh, manner to appropriate person, desh kal patra. It should not be unproductive or blind. It's not like some Haridra Narayan gets some uh, charity because he is Daridra. You say Narayan and still you say he is Daridra and over and above you give charity also to him. So Prabhupada says one should know that uh, such charity should not be given to such unauthorized persons. Nor can a wretched poor man receive much munificent charity in the way of horses, elephants, lands and villages. The right person should receive right kind of charity. A wretched person who is uh, not qualified should also not receive a very abundant munificent charity process in the way of horses, elephants and villages and lands. So intelligent men who know how to use that charity like brahmanas, they should be given the appropriate charity, especially such munificent charity. Uh, this is what is spoken in this particular verse like that. And this charity is very much glorified in the Shastras because it is said when a son is born, at that point when somebody gives charity, that charity reaps indestructible results. So that's a famous uh, Smriti statement like that. And uh, Yudhishthir gave in, in huge amounts this great charity. So Yudhishthir wanted to know about how this uh, son would uh, uh, fare would he become a great devotee of the Lord? How would he rule? So he also asked the questions to kings, sorry, to the vipras uh, present over there about uh, how this uh, parikshit would be. Tamu, tamu chur brahmanas tushta rajanam prashtrayan vitam eshishasmin prajatanto purunam paura varshabha. The learned brahmanas who were very satisfied with the charities of the king addressed him as the chief amongst the Purus and informed him that his son was certain in the line of descent from the Purus. So when Yudhishthir asked him uh, all the vipras about uh, the qualities of Parikshit, so then they started telling, they were very satisfied and they were very genuine Brahmins. So, uh, they started telling about the great qualities of this uh, uh, this child, Parikshit, who was born. So they said that he is actually the perfect, the the best, uh, I mean, the chief among all the Purus, Purunam, Pauravarshabha. You know, Puru is the, uh, Puru's dynasty is actually the dynasty which uh, is continuing all the way up to Kauravas, right? You know, one of the sons of Yayati. So from him comes... Uh, you know, Dushanta and also, you know, Bharata and from there onwards all the Kurus and all of them. So he would be the best of all these Kurus and he was perfect uh, uh, descendant of this line of Kurus, the Brahmana said. Daivena pratighatena shukle samstha mupe yushi rato vohnu grahartha vishnuna prabha vishnuna Actually, as such, this son was supposed to be dead. It was, he was dead actually. Daivena pratighatena by the uh, indefatigable daiva, this son was sanstham upeyushi. He had, he was actually dead. You know, he was uh, burnt by the Brahmastra. But then what happened? Rato Vaha Anugrahat Arthaya Vishnuna Prabhu Vishnuna. They said to Yudhishthir, O oh Yudhishthir, just to show favor to you, being obliged by your great love for the Lord, Lord wanted to bestow his mercy on you, and that's why this child was protected. Vaha Anugrahathaya for showing favor to you, Vishnuna uh, Rataha. This child was actually protected by Lord Vishnu, or it was given like Ratham can also mean Dattaha. This child was given to you as a gift by Lord. You know, so this is the gift of the Lord, and that's why this child will be known as Vishnu Ratha, or one who is protected by the Lord Vishnu. So he is Vishnu Ratha. They said, you know, in this this particular fashion, they glorified. So. Just uh, two more verses and I will stop.
तस्मात लोके भविष्य न संदेहो महाभाग महाभागवत महान so for this reason this child will be well known in the world as one who is protected by the personality of god or oh, most fortunate one there is no doubt that this child will become a first class devotee and will be all qualified with all the good qualities you know so this is why because he was protected by lord vishnu or he was given as a gift by lord vishnu vishnu na ratam or vishnu na dattam that's why he will be known as vishnu rat he will be become famous as vishnu rat and please don't have any doubt in this you know uh uh actually uh, acharya say that uh, yudhishthir with with a great i mean he felt a great chamatkar he felt uh, that uh, indeed this son would be so great uh, indeed this uh, child will be so great so that's why they are saying na sandeho mahabhag don't have any doubts o oh, yudhishthir so yudhishthir is not having doubt on parikshit as such but so much was he overwhelmed by that uh, particular situation and by that happiness uh, that uh, he really felt that okay what how would this son be uh, will he become a great devotee so that's in the answer to that they say don't have any doubt na sandeho he will become actually a mahabhagavat devotee of the lord they said you know so proper talks about three kinds of adhikaris uttama madhyama and kanishta in his uh, in his purport so last verse for today shri rajo vacha apyesha vamshan rajarshin punya shlokan mahatmanah anuvartita svidyashasa sadhu vadena sattama the good king uh, and become as saintly as a king as saintly a king as pious in his very name and as famous and glorified in his achievements as others who appeared in this great royal family so although parikshit uh, uh, about parikshit the vipra said that he will become a great mahabhagavat devotee mahabhagavata uh, especially king was asking if he will be a great king and follow his ancestors yudhishthir was happy that he will be a mahabhagavat devotee but because he was going to also be a king uh, the descendant of uh, the true uh, kuru kingdom so he also wanted to know how was he going to rule the king uh, kingdom and will he follow in the footsteps of the great rajarshis of kuru vansh uh, will he be following and displaying demonstrating those qualities so that's why yudhishthir made that particular inquiry to the vipras and in answer to this the vipras will actually uh, uh, describe the qualities of uh, parikshit they will prophesize the qualities of parikshit and uh, they will speak about how parikshit is like this in in fortitude he is like this in forbearance he is like this in tolerance he is like that so they will uh, compare parikshit and parikshit's qualities with all many different personalities and they will glorify in that manner they will also tell about parikshit's departure actually in the last three verses they will speak also how he will be cursed and he will depart uh, you know by by the curse of a son of a brahman so all these prophecies uh, are basically just uh, uh, telling about parikshit's qualities he will be like this he will be like that and propad in the purport what he does is whomever he is compared with you know all those uh, uh personalities with whom he is compared propa tells uh, in short he introduces those characters to us like with if it is shibi or uh, you know all other kings with whom he is compared so propa introduces those characters so what i want you to do is uh, from this verse 19 up to 30 you can all uh, read it for your self study from 19 to 30 Uh, because it's talking about just the prophecies about parikshit you know that's it's a very simple section about the prophecies he will be like this he will be like this like that and then uh, in next uh, session i will only took the take the end part of this particular chapter which is verse 30 onwards 31st onwards in which the story continues and then uh, we will also begin the next chapter 
in the next uh, session that we will have on Thursday. So please do this as a homework where you read yourself from uh, verse 19 to verse 30, the prophecies about resurrection. Okay. So at this point, I would like to stop and uh, see if at all there are any questions or uh, we can stop over here. Yes, so I do see the chat and I see some questions. So those of you who are willing to stay back can and those who have the service, please, uh, you can proceed. If Lord appeared in his original form, full form as per Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, then why did Sudh Goswami tell Angustha Matre in a thumb size? No, he did indeed appear in thumb size. That's why Sudh Goswami is saying thumb size. Lord did appear in thumb size. But the perception of Parikshit was in his full form. You understand? So, Lord, by his inconceivable potency, if he has to manifest in womb of Mother Uttara, so naturally Lord cannot manifest in his full form. He can manifest, but he also has that appropriateness with which he manifests. So he took a small form like he manifested in the form of Angutta. But what I'm saying is, what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's opinion is, that perception of Parikshit was actually like a full man, like a full Yatha Pramanavat, you know. Parikshit perceived him as, as a man who was, uh, I mean, as Lord who is uh, a full man and with all his normal dimensions, which Lord has. So he did appear as Angushta Matra, but Parikshit's perception can be subjective, right? Parikshit's perception is not talking about objective. Objectively, Lord appeared as Angushta Matram, but Parikshit perceived him as uh, subjectively as he would perceive any other man fully. So, Vishwan Chakravarti Thakur's opinion is for a child to be able to see a form that is only Angushta Matra and to be able to search that form in the men of this world is uh, not a very logical idea. So he feel, he says that he did see that form in all its details and yatha vat, yatha praman vat, you know, so in all its details. That's how he was very carefully uh, observing every other man, you know, and used to conclude that, no, this is not the person who saved me in the womb. That's how he was known as Parikshit. Okay. Uh, was Krishna present at the time of birth of Parikshit? Okay, so this uh, uh, Mahabharata has a different version on this completely. Uh, Mahabharata does say that uh, Lord Krishna was present at the birth of Parikshit. But I was looking at the commentaries of uh, Acharyas and uh, exactly if you see Lord is saving Parikshit Dashama say, you know, the, uh, Acharyas give the meaning that when Parikshit was 10 months old in the womb of Uttara, you know. So, if Uttara is uh, having the Lord, uh, sorry, having Parikshit for 10 months in her womb, and then exactly on which month does Parikshit appear, Parikshit uh, take birth, is not spoken in the commentaries. And if you go to Mahabharata, it's a very different version. So, that's how whether Lord Krishna was present at the time of birth of Parikshit, on the basis of Bhagavatam, at least by my own uh, reading, I couldn't find whether he was present or not. Uh, Mahabharata is a completely different version where uh, uh, Lord protects Parikshit and then what happens is later at, after Lord leaves, to, uh, leaves back from to Dwarka, he comes back and saves uh, uh, he comes back and saves Parikshit. And this is after Lord has already gone back and stayed many, many months at Dwaraka and has come back for uh, now uh, doing Ashwamed Yadnya. So that timeline is uh, actually a little different from uh, Bhagavatam's timeline. And I, I myself have to kind of work on reconciliation of these two. But it need not reconcile also because uh, it's it's Jeev Goswami's opinion that uh, the two timelines of Mahabharata and Bhagavatam also differ at many places, and that is because Lord performs pastimes 
in different manners in different uh, kalpas so that's how if i get more on this uh, from bhagavatam's timeline i would speak on it whether krishna was present at the time of birth of parash how bhagavatam is speaking is like this you know uh, krishna protected in the womb and then uh, the whole things happened kunti's prayers bishma's uh, protection bishma leaving the body and then uh, uh, yudhishthir's rule begins and then lord is ready to leave lord leaves uh, hastinapur goes back to dwaraka and now after going back to dwaraka he is invited again he is invited to attend the ashwamedh sacrifices that the yudhishthir uh, is going to do and when in between there is parikshit's birth so whether lord was present at parikshit's birth or not that idea is not clear from the commentaries lord the chapter is uh, is surely spoken by all the commentaries fine in general krishna is called gopati in this chapter son is named as gopati any significance okay uh, gopati son is known as gopati because uh, go also means earth and uh, because sun is actually uh, sun sustains the earth by its lights and sun sustains the living entities of all the earth by giving the light and by giving the i mean light is actually uh, the uh, the basic if if sun was not there all the life would be ending so if from that angle he is known as gopati you know there it doesn't refer to cows but it more refers to like go in the terms of earth and earth in terms of the all the living beings so he is that way the master of the go did krishna and parikshit meet later when parikshit grew up as the kurukshetra war happened when krishna was 89 and parikshit was in womb at that time also it is said that parikshit saw the lord when he was 10 months old in the womb when brahmast was sent also krishna spent 4 months at hastinapur after war so was krishna present on the occasion of birth of parikshit okay so this is also similar question uh, like it was asked before but in addition you are also asking whether lord met uh, parikshit any time so uh, as per mahabharat uh, 89 years is the time when lord krishna departed from kurukshetra uh, i mean war was over and then uh, yudhishthir lived for yudhishthir ruled for 36 years so 36 years uh, yudhishthir ruled why because uh, lord krishna performed past times for 36 years after kurukshetra war as soon as lord disappeared yudhishthir decided to renounce the kingdom that's how yudhishthir's rule of kingdom and lord krishna's Uh, years of past time after kurukshetra war are the same that is 36 years so 36 years is yudhishthir's king uh, total span of uh, uh, kingdom so if you add 89 and 36 becomes uh, uh, 125 years so lord krishna was uh, actually living in this world for 36 years after kurukshetra war and uh, parikshit's birth is not much after kurukshetra's war so you see parikshit for 36 years roughly 36 years of his life krishna was personally present on the planet parikshit became 36 years old you understand so actually as per mahabharat uh, parikshit is getting uh, coronated at the age of 36 years because uh, when yudhishthir is leaving roughly you can say that parikshit is almost 36 years old and that's when he is getting coronated as a king although he is heir apparent means he is the uh, as they say uh, regent prince means he is the one who will be the king next but he gets coronated after 36 years so in this much time if lord krishna was there mahabharat does say that it is quite probable that lord krishna met the uh, parikshit but the point is uh, in mahabharat um, in my reading i didn't come across any past times where parikshit uh, uh, is kind of talking to lord krishna or you know he's speaking about him and all that so so the idea as per mahabharat of parikshit trying to search supreme lord in the men of this world that must be for uh, some some years probably or some time 
before he met actually Lord Krishna, you know, where because Lord Krishna was surely present on the planet Earth uh, for the major time of Parikshit's appearance and life. And then Mahabharat say that Parikshit uh, lived for 24 more years. He ruled. So 60 years is the total lifespan of Parikshit as per Mahabharat. And uh, when he was departing, he was 60 years old. That's the Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. So you understand whenever... Uh, when, yes, Prabhu. Yes. Uh, uh, so in this question only, I want to ask, uh, like, here I mentioned one more point, that Krishna's spent more four months na, after that war, he stayed in Hastinapur. Yeah. So that time... But it is not just... I mean, where from that four months is coming? Because it is said Katipaya Masan. Yeah, I heard this in Radhavi Maharaj's class, that he, Krishna spent four months, stayed in Hastinapur. So Parishit Master and Parishit so was in, in womb. So they must have, you know, Krishna must have attended. Parishit was already in the womb. Yeah, so uh, Krishna must have been present at the time of birth ceremony of Parishit. Right, that's what. So I was saying in answer to this that you have to know exactly Parishit, uh, when did Parishit come out of the womb, you know. Then we can say because 10 months he was already there in the womb, and after that, in how much time a Bhikshit Maharaj comes out of the womb, will give a clear idea. Because Mahabharata does speak about uh, after Lord uh, instructed Bhishma Dev and uh, Vidhishthir was pacified and everything happened, Lord did leave for Dwaraka immediately. So, I mean, that's why I'm saying that. that we can make some guesses, but unless and until you have the authoritative source uh, where it is mentioned about uh, these many months Lord stayed and Lord was indeed present uh, when Parikshit took birth, then we can say accordingly like that. We can make surely some guesses like uh, as you are saying also, but because uh, this is not said in Tika, so I, I will not comment on it. Unless and until uh, you know, Mahabharat does say specifically something but because I was telling Mahabharata's version is quite different than the way we understand from Bhagavatam so uh, I would leave it up to there okay why was Kripacharya spared whereas Dronacharya killed in the war later Kripacharya became member of Yudhishthira's royal assembly though he helped in killing Abhimanyu the father of Parikshit he even recited the Vedic hymns during Parikshit's birth ceremony yes why, would, why was Dronacharya killed while Kripacharya was spared? I don't have any idea on this. I don't know. Because both were Brahmanas and uh, one was, I mean, somebody could say that Dronacharya was killed, but while Kripacharya... Of course, we know that Dronacharya was uh, sure to be killed because Drishta Dumya was born with that express purpose of uh, uh, killing Dronacharya like that. Uh, with Kripacharya, I mean, there was no such personality like that and he was saved also. But if it does have any connection in terms of their prior life, uh, I don't know. I can find this out. A lot of uh, mysteries of Mahabharata <laughs> are uh, very deep and we'll have to do a thorough study uh, of Mahabharata sometimes to answer questions related to Mahabharata. Because uh, in Tekas, uh, in Bhagavatam's versions, I have gone through uh, all the tikas, but sometimes tikas don't speak. And especially when the versions of Mahabharat and uh, tika differ, so that is when uh, we have to rely on Bhagavata only more. But uh, Mahabharat itself will need a different uh, exhaustive study actually. And it's, it's very uh, nice if we can take out time and read and understand these dynamics, try to weave them within the context of Bhagavatam also as it will uh, give a greater light about the events of Bhagavatam. Fine. What is the science behind some verses with three lines, some are two lines in Anushtub Chanda, also sudden change from eight syllables to 15 and back to eight in other verses, just wondering if you can throw some light on this. Okay. 
Fine. Uh, first thing that you are saying, sometimes verses with three lines, two lines, three and a half lines, seven and a half lines, four and a half lines, all that. So this is all done uh, usually. Uh, they are known as uh, ardhakam, sardhakam, and you know, uh, dvi sardhakam or chatur sardhakam like that. Sardhaka, ardhakam means 0. 0.5 words. Sardhakam means 1.5 words. And then you can add any digit in front of it to give different different uh, numbers. So why this is done is usually to complete a, a particular theme in the uh, section of the verses. Like suppose you want to do a description of Dwaraka. And if you want to complete this description, you have completed it in five and a half verses. So then that's it. You, you club them and say that this is, uh, you know, Panchasardhakam, five and a half verses, like that. Or rather, Panchardhakam, sorry, not Panchasardhakam. So uh, they are clubbed or grouped on the basis of uh, what is the theme of the verses. Many times some conceptual theme like narration, like opinion, like uh, one particular uh, thing will be there. And that's how they are grouped like that. So usually Jeev Goswami always explains this, saying that these three verses are together, these five are verses together, these two verses are together. So that's the reason uh, you find the grouping done in uh, uh, Anushtub. It's not only in Anushtub, even in other places you will find other chandas also. Especially in other scriptures you will find this. Also sudden change from eight syllables uh, to 15 syllables. Well, this is uh, just a vividya. This is vividta of the chandas. You know, Vyasadev is such a great poet that he doesn't have to be, you know, sticking to just one particular chanda. He shows that chanda vividya, uh, the variety of chandas to show the language and uh, to glorify the Lord in all different rasa chanda alankaras. So he wants to employ all different rasa chanda alankaras in service of the Lord and uh, just doesn't want to keep a monotonous speech of uh, just one particular chanda. It's, it's actually uh, a great asset if you study Kavya Shastra, you know, uh, and Sahitya Shastra, in that uh, this is a great bhushana when somebody uses uh, many different kinds of chandas and uh, writes them in different kind of chandas. Anushtup is considered the simplest one. So sometimes for simplicity, you use Anushtup all throughout. But actually, to be able to write uh, many different chandas in one particular poetry uh, is a sign of, uh, it's a Kavya Bhushana. Okay. These days, children are born by scissoring. Can their birth time considered appropriate? <laughs> As it is not natural birth and the horoscope made from such birth time is reliable. Uh, yeah, it's quite a, quite an appropriate objection. Yes, of course, uh, we are not against, I mean, all those things like if, if a mother really has uh, some complications and some scissoring has to be done to get the child out of her womb. So that is quite humane and it's, it could be justified. But uh, oftentimes we see that uh, it, it's, it's just becoming a trend. Uh, I mean, very less natural deliveries we see. So in such cases, uh, it's true uh, that uh, the birth at which they, uh, they are made to appear, you know, so all such birth timings and all that, will is, it's completely sometimes also kind of chosen and uh, orchestrated. So there will be complications in terms of complications in the sense I'm saying all those uh, uh, horoscope and calculations and all that, they, they can't be precise because uh, it's very much like uh, uh, sometimes a managed like that. So that's how uh, in, in horoscope, anyhow in Kali Yuga Bhaktisiddhan says that the horoscope and the astronomical calculations and all that um, because of lack of qualified priests and qualified priests to perform samskaras, he says that they have gone haywire completely. Uh, astronomical uh, uh, sciences and all those calculations. And what to speak of uh, sometimes, you know, 
all such some more factors which add to the uh, confusion and complication like that. So on one side, we, we do recognize the need of uh, a safe delivery by a mother, but also at the other side, we do see some sense of uh, artificiality and uh, <coughs> complex situation arising from that, especially when you talk about astrological charts. Chila Prabhupada talks about Vaishnava Brahmanas needed for performing samskaras. On the other hand, we hear Srila Prabhupada telling Harinam is sufficient, for example, Vrindavan Temple Open. How to reconcile? Okay. So, uh, one thing is, we, as you know, our Vidhi is, uh, uh, you know, Raga as well as Vidhi both. We have Pancharatrik Samskaras as well as uh, Bhagavat Vidhi as well as Pancharatrik Vidhi. I mean, we have this both the rails of uh, the system, Pancharatrika system, and also the system of Bhagavata. So, point is, there are times when you emphasize. You know, so, although Bhagavat Vidhi is the most important of the two, but uh, when it comes to establishing Varnashrama, when it comes to, uh, you know, especially the life of the householders, so the aspect of uh, Varnashrama in terms of those samskaras and all that becomes extremely important. In fact, it becomes kind of mandatory. So, Prabhupada in different uh, aspects or, or in different context needs of the both. If, if one sees Pancharatri Vidhi, it has its place when you talk about Varnashrama, when you talk about deity worship. Naturally, it has to be Pancharatrika Vidhi. So at least the Vidhi in terms of how much our Acharyas have given us. I am saying we may not be able to follow, you know, Pancharatrika Vidhi like some other Sampradayas, like Sri Sampradaya, because their exclusive focus is on Pancharatrika Vidhi. But whatever we have received from our Acharyas in Hari Bhakti Vilas and uh, also in books like uh, Satkriya Sardipika, so that much Pancharatrik Vidhi's emphasis has to be there. And Prabhupada speaks in those contexts like Varnashrama, uh, like uh, householder's life, and like uh, ceremonies, like also uh, temple deity worship. So that's where Pancharatrik Vidhi is very important. At the same time, uh, we do know that Bhagavat Vidhi is actually more important than Pancharatrik Vidhi. So, more important means it has to be emphasized uh, the Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smaranam, these three aspects of Bhagavat Vidhi. They are part of even Pancharatrik Vidhi. What we mean by this is our Pancharatrik Vidhi is there, but Bhagavat Vidhi, exclusive Bhagavat Vidhi also, and also Pancharatrik Vidhis are simultaneously done with Bhagavat Vidhi. Means there is chanting of the holy names, there is Kirtan of the Lord and all such activities, they go along well with Pancharatrika Vidhi also. So that's the point. Uh, it's not either of the things, but it's actually both. And in both also, the more highlighted is Bhagavat Vidhi. That's the most important, you know. But in terms of our chanting Gayatri's deity worship, Varnashram establishment, Pancharatrika Vidhi is a must. We can't do away with it. Srila Jeeva Goswami says clearly in Sandarbhas that Pancharatriki Vidhi is a must for a sadhaka who wants to cross over Anarth Nivruti stage. So he says the engagement of the senses by Pancharatriki Vidhi is ideal for a sadhaka's Anarth Nivruti. And that's how he says that uh, it has to be very much emphasized in the places where it should be emphasized like that. But it's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's special contribution that uh, he has made the Bhagavat Vidhi available for all of us. Although actually Bhagavad Vidhi is meant for Mahabhagavata as ideal. So our Sampradaya has this combination of Bhagavad and Pancharatriki Vidhis. Okay. So Prabhupada speaks in a context specific way. And if we know the context, then we understand that uh, uh, why he is emphasizing one particular thing. Okay, Prabhu. So hi, I'm done with the questions which are there in the chat. So, are there any questions uh, from anybody else which are left or you want to ask personally? Uh, 
or at this point then we can drop and uh, proceed yes uh, prabhu anyone balbhadra kripa prabhu it's all done no prabhu ji now we okay. are giving individual login to everyone so they will all directly to you okay fine fine okay please so we will uh, uh, begin with uh, next chapter i mean the last part of this and the next chapter on uh, thursday and i am hoping that on thursday and friday we should be able to i think mostly we should be able to finish uh, the chapter last chapter chapter 13 okay then we stop here grantra shrimad bhagavatam ki shrila prabhupada ki nithaya gaur premanande hari hari bol